Full spoilers for Spider-Man No Way Home and The Batman. You've been warned. Both Spider-Man and Batman have recently graced the silver screen with big budget tent poles that cost a fortune, and both films may be nostalgic for their respective superhero movies in the 2000s. Namely, Spider-Man No Way Home made me reminiscent of the incredible craft deployed by Sam Raimi, Don Burgess, and Bill Pope. Craft that is lacking in poorly lit, overly green screen, sloppily scripted scenes meant to desperately tie together two decades of Spidey film canon so that Tom Holland can stand alongside Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. The Batman made me nostalgic for 2005's Batman Begins and 2008's The Dark Knight. But not because it is derivative of those movies or because this iteration of Batman pales in comparison. It instead makes me think back to a time when these big budget movies flexed with awesome practical action and watertight scripts. It conjured the feeling of awe I had during the Christopher Nolan era. Spider-Man No Way Home only wants to reference the previous movies to create a feeling of joy in the audience. Franchises can only reference themselves now, a point The Matrix Resurrections made fun of, and rightfully so. The Batman looks to Seven the same way The Dark Knight looked to Heat. It features clear story and visual comparisons to other great movies, but it is something else all its own. It is the culmination of a seasoned writer, director, and Matt Reeves who has previously delivered the horror and action that proves he's right for the nights. The Batman shows what has been missing from big budget movie making has seen in Spider-Man No Way Home. It's not an awful movie, but it doesn't go the extra mile to really deliver a gorgeous and thrilling experience like it could have. Greg Fraser's cinematography is impeccable. I can't believe that he's delivered to us Dune and the Batman across 2021 and 2022 respectively. This is some Bill Pope, Matrix sequel, Spider-Man 2 energy. The guy has always been crushing it. Look at the cinematography of Killing Them Softly from 10 years ago, and you'll see that Fraser is a seasoned, anamorphic master. Just look at this filth. I think sometimes it's hard for you to watch a movie like No Way Home and see why it's so flat and so uninteresting to look at, but then when you see a blockbuster like Dune or The Batman, it's easier to see what's missing. There is no mood or overpowered feelings that can be derived from the way New York is depicted in No Way Home. The colors are flat and the green screen pickup shots stick out like a sore thumb. The shadows are never dark enough to create real contrast. And when the camera does do something interesting, it feels like an experimental moment rather than a concerted effort to create a cohesive visual language for the film. Whereas Matt Reeves' pursuance for voyeuristic angles certainly has a touch of Hitchcock and De Palma, evident in the Batman, but also in his earlier work. In Let Me In, the 2010 horror adaptation of the Swedish novel Let the Right One In, Reeves and DP Greg Frazier create some truly arresting work. It is a really telling mix of voyeurism, warm hues in a cold setting, and a great use of light and shadow that prove these two were perfect for a trip to Gotham City. Seriously, for a movie in winter, it's actually very warm with nice, burning orange colors that clearly precede the work done on the Batman. Like the winter months, we expect Gotham to come across colder and more blue in tone, but it works perfectly in both. Gotham is rainy and murky, but the warmer tones make the city feel ready to blow. This is about a king, and Rither's the match. Protagonist of Let Me In, Owen, spies on various characters throughout the movie. When we watch people through someone's eyes, it immediately brings their perspective of events to the forefront. That's why this Batman feels like the focus where other movies have perhaps seen him overshadowed by the villains. Everything feels very attuned to his understanding of the world and his reaction to events. The voyeuristic camera work as he spies on Selina or the mob or records every inch of a crime scene really helps to sell this. Many final shots in the Batman movies are big and epic, but this movie ends on an intense, closely framed image of a heartbroken bat speeding away. I also let Spider-Man No Way Home off the hook in part because I knew it was a COVID shoot. As boring as it is to hold key conversations in jail cells, Benedict knows what that's like. It was of course necessary as a workaround to restrictions, but now that we've seen The Batman, a film that was also shot predominantly during COVID, there really is no excuse. Whilst there might be one too many returning locations could the bat and the cat hold their meetings on a different roof, there is certainly character to the city of Gotham. It rarely feels restricted by COVID mandates because the cinematography works smarter, making great use of the screen technology Greg Fraser worked on with The Mandalorian. This stuff is so much better than green screen because you can actually light the room. The design of Gotham City helps this as well. Utilizing British cities including Liverpool and Glasgow helps to capture the gothic feel as well as the animated series and the Arkham games. It feels claustrophobic and grimy and lived in. The way the city is designed and captured makes it so clear throughout the movie the hold that Falcone and the mob have. 
Of course, New York is a real place, but that doesn't mean that production design couldn't have brought out more of its character. It doesn't help that the script for No Way Home leaves little time for the inhabitants of the city to make their voices heard. Peter has a FaceTime with Jay Jonah, and by extension the city, in which he explains the villains being here is his fault. But we never get a sense of how the city views him past the first 30 minutes, and the finale takes place away from civilian danger, the obvious place for them to come into play. In the Batman's first appearance, the civilian he saves begs him not to hurt him, but by the end he transforms into a true hero saving the drowning citizens from Riddler's real change. It leads to one of the best shots in the movie that perfectly captures the hopeful side to the character and proves he's more than just abject darkness. I thought most of the action in No Way Home was pretty bad. Sure, there was some decent hand-to-hand -hand stuff between Holland and the foe in both the apartment scene and at the end. Decent choreography that packs a wallop in the edit and I can tell what's going on. Groovy, really. But in terms of the rest of it, I'm not so sure. In particular, the finale takes place on a dimly lit piece of scaffolding. No one really throws many punches, and there isn't a sense of jeopardy that is comparable to Green Goblin, Doc Ock, or even the Vulture by themselves. Seeing set photos of an abandoned moment between Toby and the foe just makes it even worse. How the fuck would you show me something if I couldn't have it then? I think this finale could have gone much harder. We should have gotten more rousing musical moments, more well-staged bouts between the Spider-Man and the Sinister Six. Five, Green Goblin should have rocked Andrew and Toby's crap just as much as Holland before that final beatdown. Everything is just so murky and hard to look at. The action in the Batman is fantastic. There's a subjectivity to the car chase that gives us a very frenetic energy. Reeves and Fraser choose to keep most of the action bolted into the cars, where we see the chase from the inside of the vehicles. This makes for a very personal and intense scene. It's a Batmobile chase that offers big, bombastic thrills as good as in Batman Begins with a much more intimate, distinctive style. Both chases are great, and that's what I love about this film. Where other franchise fare can sometimes seek to be an inferior copy of its predecessor, this movie adds to Bat Cannon in a variety of glorious ways. Now I have several different fantastic Batmobile chases to enjoy, all captured very differently. The predominant use of interior vehicle shots calls to mind some of the greatest car chases to ever be put to screen. The French Connection, Bullet, To Live and Die in LA, the former Reeves has recently cited as a direct inspiration. These chases are so good because they have such a clear point of view. To Live and Die in LA consistently throws more and more trouble at the car and we track every reaction every fear, every freaking moment from within the car. Throughout the chase in the Batman, we very much get into the mind of the rageful, determined bat and the poor penguin who is terrified and way in over his head. The brief moment where he thinks he's finally dusted the bat is memorable because we see his relief so wholeheartedly and it's frankly hilarious to see his face drop straight after. and the sound design, just wow. As Batman walks across a crime scene or emerges out of the shadows, the sound design for his suit is immaculate. The metal clanks, you can even hear the squeaks of the leather and possibly black rubber. Everything has such a great tactile nature. The burst of his grapple guns as they taxi driver out of his wrist. The nuts and bolts that shift from the vibrations of the terminals above the Batcave. In particular, the metallic sounds that only sell you on the body armor he frequently makes use of. But when his entrances and walks are framed like that of a cowboy, the sound design accentuates that. Everything feels like it has this care and craft behind it. Have you noticed how most blockbusters now can't ever get their characters to shut up? We seldom let the action speak for itself. Someone has to crack wise or deliver a piece of the plot to keep things moving. The Batman was a breath of fresh air in terms of this. Rather than seeing a flashback to the Wayne's murder, Bruce locks eyes of another child who's experienced the same trauma and Nirvana something in the way drops. The story is told in the cut. In this moment, we learn everything we need to know about Bruce's mental state, his empathy, and the pain that drives him. Michael Giacchino's score rises as we see it flourish paired with the action. A good score is only really as memorable as how well it's used in the movie. Toby and Andrew's spiders have some of the best themes and I can barely register a moment when they came into play. Now Michael Giacchino also composed the score for No Way Home, and sure they played them in subtle ways during one or two little moments, but why didn't we ever get them in full? Wouldn't it make sense to get more of that in the final battle, or a medley of all three themes? That would have been awesome. Michael Giacchino's Can't Fight City Halloween, A Bat in the Rafters Part 2, and Highway to the Anger Zone are all great tracks that perfectly complement the action and are given the time to really be heard. 
If you think it's unfair to use No Way Home as a point of comparison, consider that this movie made over a billion dollars at the box office as part of a well-oiled machine that has destroyed mid-budget movies. All the detractors really want is some filmic elements to be used in a more creative and engaging way than they currently are. Matt Reeves isn't pleased about the current landscape of theatrical releases either, but knows that if superheroes are here to stay, they'd better be damn good. So whilst Batman 12 is still Batman 12, no matter how you title it, there is at least a creative vision, a satisfying mood, action that sells, and well-drawn characters. While I do prefer the Batman over Spider-Man No Way Home, I just wanted to showcase how the Batman was really a breath of fresh air for superhero movies and how it redefined the genre. And by no means am I saying is one better than the other objectively. Both movies are peak cinema and are some of the most enjoyable and greatest comic book superhero movies of all time. You don't need to hate the other simply because you like one of them. I truly love both companies' directions for their movies, Marvel's towards its cinematic universe and DC's towards its director-driven films. But overall, one thing is for certain. Being able to live in an era and to see both blockbuster movies is truly a magnificent and breathtaking experience.